Okay, hi everybody and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to cover off a definition of what AWS AppStream 2.0 is, what it does, and how you can benefit from using it. We have the AWS definition directly cut and paste from the AppStream website here. You can pause the video at this point and read through it. However, I'm going to step through the benefits in the next slide around what AppStream 2.0 is and, and why it's useful. So first and foremost, AWS AppStream is a hosted service with automatic scaling built in. You have one user per instance, um, so that means you need the, 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 to allocate the right amount of instances for the actual user load that you're going to have connecting. It's a remote internet-based Windows application streaming service for HTML5 enabled browsers. Now there's a video and a demo of what that will look like, but that's ultimately it. That's This is ultimately what AppStream 2.0 does. Uh, it's a simple alternative to things like Microsoft RDP or Citrix, Zen App or Zen Desktop. And we'll walk through now some of the benefits of using AppStream. For example, it provides instant on, which means that as soon as a user connects, the, the, the application streaming is available straight away. Ultimately, that, that means that the instances are always powered on and online waiting for a user to connect. Um, so streaming your application with AppStream 2.0 lets the user start using the application immediately. Uh, we can remove things like device constraints, which is on the end user platforms for, or the end user device. So we can leverage the compute power of the AWS infrastructure to deliver experiences that wouldn't normally be possible locally on the user's computers. And that could be for things like graphics processing units or GPUs. Users need a very specific expensive GPU that isn't compatible with their endpoint. We could spin up AWS AppStream instances that have GPUs in them. Uh, to be able to deliver those applications. We've got multiple platform support or multi-platform support. Um, so we could take the, our existing applications and start streaming them to browsers without any app modifications. If it's a native Windows device, we can install it and deliver it to Android, to Mac, and to Windows endpoints, so long as they have a HTML5 enabled browser. It makes Updates easy for the applications because the app is centrally managed on Amazon AppStream. Updating the app is as simple as providing a new version of that app um, and then the instances can reboot and then the users have the latest and greatest version. So you don't have to go to your multiple endpoints, your thousands of users, computers to update them all manually. And there's improved security. So unlike traditional box software and digital downloads where the application is actually available for theft and possible reverse engineering, Amazon AppStream stores and executes the application securely within the AWS data centers. And it only provides the pixel streaming. They never actually have the software. They never actually download anything to their endpoints. Um, so from a security perspective, that's a really important one as well. So to give you an idea of what the infrastructure kind of looks like, um, you can see my very ugly diagram here. Here's my, here's me sitting in the cloud as a, as a stick figure. I've lost a lot of, a lot of weight apparently. Um, and I'm connecting over the internet with my HTML5 enabled browser. And I will connect to a stack in AWS AppStream. And that stack will have some policies that are assigned to it. And those policies will be things like don't allow cut and paste or set up the users when they connect to a fleet to have an S3 home drive um, so that the settings persist across sessions or another setting like allow the users to connect to Google Drive when they log into our fleet here. So then we have fleets and in the fleets you've got multiple instances of computers basically which is you have one user that connects to the first instance, uh, the second user connects to the second instance and the fleet will automatically scale and descale depending on how many users are connecting or what limits and, and what scaling policies you provide for the fleet. The fleets themselves and the instances within are, uh, are based on an image or images that you have built yourself or utilized from AWS. Um, so this is where the image builder comes into it. You can create your own image. From there, you can install your own software, your own line of business applications. You save that to your own private image, and then the entire fleet is built on that image. We'll talk a little bit now about availability zones and regions. So AppStream is only available in some AWS regions, not all. I think there's seven in total, so we've got Ireland, Singapore, Sydney, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Northern Virginia, and Oregon. It would be recommended to spin up AppStream resources as close as geographically possible 
to the backend resources. Like, imagine we're spinning up a line of business application and it has a big database that it needs to communicate with. You would spin those resources up in the same AWS availability zones so that they have low latency when they're talking to each other. We can link AppStream regions with other resource locations via regional VPC peering. For example, let's say I have lots of services and databases and RDS instances in my AWS account that are spun up in London or EU-West-2. And I need the AppStream services and infrastructure to be able to communicate from Ireland to London. In that instance, we could spin up a VPC peer between those two sites. There's only some features that are available in some regions, so you need to take note of the infrastructure that's available for AppStream in the region you're looking to deploy, and that covers things like GPUs. Here we go, you can see the regions of where the availability, uh, of where AppStream is available throughout the AWS infrastructure, and they're bringing more online all the time. So the regional selection for AppStream may be affected by the following things. The proximity to subscribers, so how far away users are to the information and to the AppStream services. For example, if I'm a Sydney-based user and I have AppStream instances or services that are over here in Oregon, the latency that's introduced via that connection may be large. Whereas if I'm a AWS or if I'm a user in Sydney and my AppStream instances are available in Sydney, then that latency is going to be far lower and that experience for the users is going to be much better. So proximity to data or databases, if we go back again and have a look at our pretty picture, uh, imagine I have some AppStream services that are running in Singapore, but I have some databases and some infrastructure that's sitting in Tokyo. I could do one of two things. I could have a VPC peer between the Singapore region and the Tokyo region, or I could spin up a, a AppStream services and instances in the Tokyo region so that it's talking with as low latency as possible to the infrastructure that's in Tokyo. It really depends on the infrastructure of the application and where your stuff is sitting within AWS. So just make sure you're aware of that when you're deploying your AWS AppStream so the regional selection for AppStream may also be affected by the scaling requirements. Now, when you're scaling and you're spinning up AppStream instances, you need to request the levels of AppStream that are available for you. Um, you may find that uh, some of those instances or those services aren't available in that region and or that you're spinning up too much or that AWS simply can't provide it for you. So you would need to look into that as part of your planning and your architectural designs for AWS AppStream. Uh, here's a list of additional resources that will be available for you in the course and you can click on them and, and go and learn more directly about the AppStream homepage. Uh, getting started with AppStream 2.0. Some frequently asked questions which are fantastic by the way. They're really, really good resource to give you a quick idea of, of what is available and what isn't. And of course the pricing link here. So guys, thanks very much for joining for this video. This is it for this video. Uh, please do carry on unless you have any questions. Please, of course, get in touch with me and let me know if there's any issues or questions or anything you want to know about. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video. Guys, thanks for your time, and we'll see you then. Bye now.